Glory to God. Welcome to Wednesday Night Abundant Grace Church Service. I feel like I say it this way every week, but bears repeating, right? Everybody good tonight? You excited for the word? You ready for the word? Hallelujah. Let's stand on our feet. Let's worship the Lord. Father God, we thank you for an opportunity to be here tonight. We thank you that we do have this place to come to with these midweek services, Father, so that we can continue to be built up in the word as the week goes on. Father, we thank you that you're going to meet each and every one of us exactly at our point of need tonight through praise and worship, through surrender, Father. Surrender to you. Father, we say have your way in the service tonight, and we thank you. We thank you for impartation of revelation knowledge into each and every one of our lives, and we thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You guys may be, oh, we're not going to be seated. We're not there yet. See, that's the kind of day it's been. You know, I, I came here and I was telling, I was telling a full moon tonight because people are a little interesting today. I don't know if it was just me or I'm the only one of you guys experienced it, but people have been fresh. There's like no other way to put it. People have been fresh. But glory to God, we have the greater one on the inside and he overcame everything. Therefore, we can overcome everything. Amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with the song of deliverance from my enemy. Till all my fears are gone, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You believe that tonight? I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into a family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me and I can stand and sing. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. 
I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I am a child of God I am a child of God Hallelujah. You guys believe that tonight? You know, while we were doing that song, and I just mentioned it, I really thought it was a full moon, like something was going really just kind of a wacky day. And people were just, at least for me, were coming against me from like 40, 50 different angles, it seemed like. But then, you know, God just spoke to my heart while we were singing that song is people are afraid. People are in fear. They're in fear about what's going on still with the coronavirus, kids going back to school, don't know how that's going to turn out. You know, they're just, they're, they, the uncertainty of the world is just put them into a fearful attitude, right? Or into a spirit of fear. And thank God, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You know, we don't have to be fearful, even with those that are fearful are coming against us. They're just trying to come against us to bring fear on us. And what do we have to do? Not take it. Amen. Glory to God. Because God is our source and everything. Amen. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness, like mighty mountain, your justice flows like the ocean's tide. And I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your wing. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness, like a mighty mountain, your justice flows like the ocean's tide. And I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your wing. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness like a mighty mountain. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide. And I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your wing your love of lord reaches to the heaven your faithfulness stretches to the sky hallelujah he is so good to us right so awesome and that's the key. Love is the key, right? Love is what it's all about. 
You know, looking at, like we said, the people in the world that are angry, they're hurt, they're concerned, they're worried. And if they ever got a hold of how much God loves them and hopefully we can bring that love of God to them, their lives will be changed. They would never, ever have to experience fear again. Amen? This Keith Moore song that we've been kind of singing these last couple weeks has just kind of been going around and around in my head because this is it. This is all about faith, right? And uh, how many people know the word says, the just shall live by faith. And living by faith means we also walk by faith and not sight. Amen. Lord, I believe what you said to me. I don't care what I see Your word is more real to me Lord, I believe What you said to me I don't care what I feel to me, your word is more real. Lord, I receive what you gave to me. I don't care what I see. Your word is more real to me. Lord, I receive what you said to me. I don't care what I feel. To me, your word is more real. I'm not moved by circumstantial change. Your word is always just the same. What I feel and see may come and go. Your word's an anchor for my soul. Your word's an anchor for my soul. Lord, I believe what you said to me. I don't care what I see. Your word is more real to me. Lord, I believe what you said to me I don't care what I feel to me your word is more real I'm not moved by circumstantial change your word is always just the same what I feel and see may come and go. Your word's an anchor for my soul. Your word's an anchor for my soul. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're going to continue to worship the Lord with our giving. So if you guys need a giving envelope or an offering envelope, uh, Brother Paul will get that in your hands. And so many ways that you guys can sow into the ministry here at Abundant Grace Church. So um, if you're at home watching on live stream, you can text your offering to 732-856-5050. Or you can go online at www.abundantgracechurch.com. Just pull down the giving tab and you can give that way. If it's your first time going through any of those platforms, 
you'll just be prompted to set up your account for the first time, and after that, you're good to go. And how many people know the Lord loves a cheerful giver? I wanted, my wife's not here tonight. She's actually working, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call her out on something funny uh, when it comes to giving. And Tom can attest to this because he knows how she is, right? So a lot of times, depending on when our payroll hits, lately our, our payroll company has been messed up because we have our payroll checks delivered by UPS, right? And UPS is backed up because of what's going on with deliveries. So normally they show up on Friday and then they clear for service on Sunday. But lately they've been coming on Mondays. So my wife, being my wife, cannot wait until Sunday or Wednesday night to give. She has to, as soon as that, that, that check clears the account, she's got to go online and do the, I don't even, does she do text to give, Tom, or does she do the church? I don't even know. <laughs> it, share faith, right, immediately. But that just shows me and shows, I know it shows the Lord where her heart is at, right? We can't wait to give, right? Not so we can get, so that we know that we're just being obedient to what God's told us to do. And then we, when we sow in the king, into the kingdom, we know that, yes, it's God's promise that will produce for us. But we also know that it advances the gospel. And that's why God is looking at finances, right? He doesn't need it. He just needs our hearts. And there's, there's something that makes you feel so uplifted and good when you sow into the kingdom, knowing that you've been obedient to God and that the word is going to go forth and you've, you're about kingdom business when you sow. Amen? Glory to God. So uh, let's believe God for a good offering and uh, we'll pray. Father God, thank you for an opportunity to sow in your kingdom, Father, as each one of us has done this cheerfully tonight. Your word says that you would multiply it back to us, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, Father, that it will come back to us in many ways, Father. And we thank you for the favor of God on our lives to financially prosper, as you promised in your word. And we thank you that Every single debt here at Abundant Grace Church is being reduced and eliminated. We call this ministry, this church facility, debt-free in Jesus' name. name. And, And I declare and decree that tonight over everybody that's giving into this offering, that believing the word of God being true, that you are debt free. And when everybody stands on that for a debt free lifestyle, you will have it. And I thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Paul, you may do your thing. Lord, I believe what you said to me. I don't care what I see. Your word is more real to me I'm not moved by circumstantial change Your word is always just the same What I feel and see may come and go Your word's an anchor for my soul your words an anchor for my soul. Hallelujah. Let's shift some gears and let's get into that anchor for our soul. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. It is a not that I believe in that, but I know I know there's something to do with uh you know, the magnetic pull of the moon and the tides and when in doubt, stay on God's side. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Ephesians chapter two. And while you're doing that, we'll pray. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you that the word is alive and sharper than any two edged sword, Father. And as we hear the word tonight. We become doers of the word, and it would facilitate change in our lives, Father. And I just ask you that everybody that hears my voice tonight would have supernatural ears to hear the word, hearts that are receptive for it to take root, and that they it would produce in their lives. Because the Bible tells us your word never returns void. And Father, I yield to the anointing on my life to preach your word, not as I've had it, 
as or prepared it, but as you'd want it. And I say, Holy Spirit, speak through me that you are the need meter for each and every ear that hears tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So last week, if you remember, we were talking about um, your past not being a life sentence, right? And that the enemy tries to remind us about who we were before we were saved, and even after we, you know, we're saved, he tries to remind us and bring back to our recollection where we've messed up as a Christian, you know, and that's one of his tactics. But as we went through last week, um, we were looking at your past not being uh, a stumbling block for you in your present or your future. So kind of on the heels of that, we went through a bunch of principles last week so that you could overcome your past. But the biggest principle that we looked at, uh, how to overcome our past, was really what tonight's message is based on. And the title of tonight's message is, What's on Your ID? Amen? So I told you guys to turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's start in verse 1, and I think we're going to read down to verse 7. So, And I'm reading out of the Amplified Edition. Excuse me. And you. So this is Jesus talking to, or actually Paul, talking to us. And you, he made alive. When you were dead, slain by your trespasses and sins. So Jesus has made us alive alive, even though we were dead in sin, slain by our trespasses, in which at one time you walked habitually. So, so many times, I could speak for myself, when I was not walking with the Lord, I can honestly say sin was a habit for me. You know, we, we talk about Christianity not being about head knowledge, not just I know scripture, but about application of the word of God in our lives, meaning it's a lifestyle. Before we were saved, we were habitually in a lifestyle of sin. It was a habit. Now, as a believer in Jesus Christ, our habit should be a lifestyle of Christianity, a lifestyle of being what? In Christ. So in case you were wondering where I was going with the title of my message tonight, your, identity, your, your, your ID should say, in Jesus Christ. That is where we identify and what we are identifying, who we're identifying with. So, in one, in one time you walked habitually, you were following the course and fashion of this world. We're under the sway of the tendency of this present age. Following the prince of the power of the air, you are obedient to and under control of the demon spirit that still constantly works in the sons of disobedience, the careless, the rebellious, the unbelieving, who go against the purposes of God. Among these, we as well, as you once lived and conducted ourselves in the passions of our flesh, our behavior governed by our corrupt and sensual nature, obeying the impulses of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind, our cravings dictated by our senses and our dark imaginings. We were then by nature children of God's wrath and heirs of his indignation like the rest of mankind. That speaks about who we were once right? And that's what the enemy wants to try to bring back to you of who you were once. He wants to remind you of everything you were before. And we're really not talking about overcoming your past tonight, but really we still have some battles to fight for our future and our present. The enemy's not going to stop. Even if we've um, erased our past from our lives, it doesn't exist to us anymore, the enemy still wants to come and bring more stuff to us to make, it think, make us think that we're still that old person, right? And it goes on here in verse 4, but this is where it gets so awesome, and you'll see where we're going with this tonight. But God, so rich is he in his mercy, because of, in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love which he loved us, even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses. He made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ to himself, the same new life with which he quickened him, for it is by grace his favor and mercy, which you did not deserve, that you were saved, delivered from judgment, and made partakers of 
Christ's salvation. And he raised us up together with him and made us sit down together, giving us joint seating with him in the heavenly sphere by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. He did this that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come the immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace, his unmerited favor in his kindness and goodness of heart towards us in Christ Jesus. I get excited when I read that. I get excited because I get reminded of who I once was and who I am now. But again, the title of the message is, What's on Your ID? So I wanted to start out with a question tonight to you guys. That, that was just setting up what we're going to talk about. My question is, are you identifying with Christ? Now, I'm sure you guys say, absolutely, I'm saved, I come to church, I read the Word, but that's not what I asked. My question is, are you, and you guys that are watching out there, are you 100% identifying with Christ? And that's what I want to look at tonight. We're going to do a little heart check. So, people that are not saved, but this goes for Christians too, when we're not identifying with Christ, what are we identifying with? And you kind of get that in the Ephesian scriptures we just read, but I wanted to kind of look at it a little bit deeper. People that are not saved, and Christians as well, sometimes identify with their job title or their position. There's nothing wrong to have a job title or a position. But the, the the, qua the crazy question, I, yeah, you guys get this, and I'm inferring it from a perspective of people saying, um, what do you do? And they're really asking you, what do you do for a living, right? What do you do? And what do we answer? Well, we'll answer things like, I'm a contractor, I'm a teacher, I'm a banker, I'm a realtor, et cetera, right? But is that what God believes you to be? Are you your job title? No. And I want to show you this tonight. In Matthew chapter 8, or 28 rather, verses, uh, we'll look at verses 18 and 20 again from the Amplified. Jesus approached and breaking the silence said to them, all authority, all power of rule in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go then, and I want you guys to really take a look at these two words. Go then and make disciples. The King James says, doesn't say make, it says teach. Go then and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you all the days, perpetually, uniformly, and on every occasion, to the very close and consummation of the age. Amen. We are not defined by our job title. Jesus himself is telling us we are to make and teach and disciple people. That's our true job title. There's nothing wrong with working, having a job title, and advancing in your career and being the best you can be on your job. But the true you is being a teacher and disciple of Jesus Christ. The word make, I said, literally means to become a pupil and a disciple to instruct and to teach. What does that mean? We're supposed to share the good news. That's our true nature. That's our job title. Amen? Disciple, and I just read, is a Greek word, autos, which simply means himself, herself, themselves, itself, he, she, and it. So we're supposed to become disciples of the word ourself, right? Pupils of the word. And I remember, I think we were talking about this a couple of Wednesdays back. There's a difference between being a believer in Jesus Christ and being a pupil. A pupil wants to go deeper, wants to learn more and more. And then what do we do when we do that? We disciple and teach others. That's our true job title. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to tell you guys a story about something that was going on for me few years back, this is probably two or three years ago, I was struggling with doing what I do every day. I've had a 30-year career in the mortgage business. You guys 
probably all know that at this point. And it doesn't mean I, I don't enjoy what I do, um, you know, or my, you know, the people that work for me and, and you know, the, my, my whole setup of doing this for 30 years. And it has been financially good to me. But I was struggling with the ministry side of my life. You know, Lord, you, know, you, you put this call on my life years ago. And, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going to call myself out. Sometimes the flesh rises up and going, I'm believing, and I've been believing for years, that I'm going to wind up in full-time ministry. What the heck is going on? So I just wanted to do some stuff with taking my job to, uh, my business to, figures, take my business to a little bit different of a level, approach it a little bit differently. So I hired a coach, a, a new coach. Um, and I think it's always good in every area of your life to have somebody that's accountable, whether it's spiritually with you or somebody in business that's business accountability for you. And, and the, the, the consulting firm that I actually hired is a Christian-based business coaching firm. So my business coach was a 100% you know, sold-out believer, and that's how we approached every one of our meetings. And I told him, I, I, I said, Steve, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with what I, what I believe God's called me to do, still going to work today because I believe anything we do, we do to the glory of God. So if I'm still working, I have to give it 120%, right? Because God has not moved me into the new position yet full time. And he's like, no, you, you're right. And he said, but you're, you're identifying wrong. I said, I'm identifying wrong? What do you mean? He goes, you're looking y yourself that you're, you're do, you do mortgage loans for a living, and you're a minister. He said, stop looking at yourself that way. Start looking yourself as a pastor who just happens to do mortgages. And I was like, oh, that's good. My identity was, I didn't realize it. I was frustrated because I was not fulfilling in ministry what I thought I was fulfilling, but my timing isn't my timing. It's God's timing, and I'm just waiting on God. And he said, you gotta, you got to change what you're looking at. Like we've been talking at Fridays. you you got to see something different. you got to see who you are in Christ, what your job description is in Christ, and then the other thing that you're doing that you think is your job is really the second part. And I'll tell you what, guys, I still have struggles sometimes here and there with running the business and doing everything, but it opened my eyes to say, I can have peace with that. I can be peaceful with that because now my identity has changed. My identity isn't the business. My identity is the pastor that just happens to do the business. Amen? So that's kind of what we want to talk about tonight. Where is my identity? We may think it's in Christ, but sometimes it's in other things, and maybe you don't even realize it. So the world identifies with job titles, positions. You know, I'll never forget it. When I first started in business, I was young in the mortgage business, for the mortgage business at the time. I think I was 1993, so I was like 25 or 26. And I, I got promoted after the first year of the company I started working for to the sales manager. And they handed out cards. Well, if you're the sales manager, you're now the assistant vice president of the company. Man, I thought I was all that in a bag of chips. What did that mean? Nothing. Nothing. It meant absolutely nothing but give out your card. The assistant vice president. The heck is that? You know, I'm the, vi I'm the vi vice president of J.P. Morgan Chase. There's 47,000 of them. But people will identify with that. Why? Pride makes me feel good about me. And that's what I was looking at. The heck with the title. A bunch of headaches came along with the title. But I was the assistant vice president. I look back to those days now, and I'm like, what was I thinking? Identifying with the wrong thing. Nothing wrong to be that, but you can't live that. You have to live what Jesus has called you to do. So that verse of the verse of scripture we had just read leading up to that little story I told, too many people are laboring under a false assumption that Jesus was just talking to the disciples and not talking to us. He was telling us, no, 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 you're mine. Now you guys got to go become pupils, and now you need to teach people about me. That's our true identity. That's our true calling. That's who we were designed by God to be right, to bring the gospel to a lost and dying world. Amen? What do people also identify with? They, they identify with their job titles. We looked at that, but they also 
identify with their finances. Like you could have a great job title that could have no good income attached to it. You could be the chief bottle washer of, you know, smorgasbordia or whatever that might come with a dollar a week paycheck. Great title, not so good on the financial side, right? But people will identify with their finances. Their identity is found in their finances or the opposite, their lack thereof. Too many people go through life thinking that an abundance of finances will cure everything. And that's just an absolute lie. So many people identify with loving money and seeking it above all else. And there's overwhelming evidence to the contrary that people, what they believe, which is money will buy happiness. Before I was saved, I had a stupid quote I used to use when people would say that to me. It was dumb, but I'm going to share it with you just to prove how dumb it was. I used to say, yeah, you're right, money won't buy happiness, but it'll buy me a boat big enough to pull up right next to it. But if you don't have happiness, you can have the boat, the car, the house, the mansion, the wife, the kids, the jewelry. But without happiness, without the love of God, and the love of God in us, through us, operating in us to make us have that peace, or to allow us to have that peace that surpasses all understanding, you have nothing. Trust me, if you ask me sometime and I share my testimony, I tried that. Didn't work. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Let me clear this up. Money itself is not evil. Money is necessary. God wants you to be financially prosperous, to have not only your needs met, but to have an overabundance of wealth to have money as long as your money does not have you. Because then you're identi identifying with what? Your money. All kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Think about this, and I'm not going to name names, but were there ministers that were preaching the gospel that got greedy? I'd be lying if I said no, right? Because there's a, you know, I, I forget who it was. I forget, it was Jesse Duplantis or... Kenneth Copeland or somebody said, if you went into ministry for money, you went into it for the wrong reasons. Now, God wants you to be prosperous, but you can't have, you can't go into ministry for the thought of, I'm going to get rich, because then you are no use to anybody, right? The prosperity will come if your heart is right. And that's, that's what this verse of scripture is talking about to us, right? I want to look at a specific word in what we just read. Uh, at the end of the verse of Scripture, end of 10, it says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The word sorrows there is a Greek word that also means grief and pain. And the craving to get riches above all else always winds up in a cycle that only ends in ruin and destruction. I see so many people chasing after money, chasing after money, chasing after money. Now, they may get it, but what have they sacrificed to get there? Their families, their children, right? When that love of money that they're after only becomes their only focus, everything else now shrinks back and means nothing, and it's not the order that God ordained to be. The seeking alone after money for the sake of money. You know, I don't know about you guys, I'm, one of my favorite shows, I'm showing my age a little bit, is MASH. Ever guys watch MASH? It's, on, it's still on yeah. channel 808 every night, and I watch it almost every night. And there's, there's a story, and I don't know why I'm telling this story, but it, it's the illustration. They're trying to get an incubator to sterilize 
uh, medical equipment. They can't get one. So they go to see like this crooked um, supply sergeant. And they go in there and said, well, we need an incubator. Ours was stolen. And he's like, you can't have one. He's like, but you have three. You're right. And if I have three. And if I give you one, I'll only have two. They're like, what does that mean? Exactly what it means. But people get that way about money. I've got a million bucks, but I got to chase after the second million so I can have two. Has your lifestyle really changed from the one million to the two million? No. You're just so afraid, so fearful that if you don't continue to chase after money, there's going to be a problem. When the reality is if we chase after God, the finances will come to us. Too many Christians and non-Christians alike place their identity in the size of their bank balance, investments and retirement funds, and even the government. There's nothing wrong with having those things, but that cannot be our identity. In my business, How many times, especially now since it's changed a lot since 2007 and 8 with the economic downturn, that we went through all these new regulations inside my industry. And I get people, and I'm just telling you guys this because I deal with this every day, I'll get somebody say, well, I'm buying a house for $700,000, I'm putting down $300,000, I'm financing $400,000, I want a loan. Well, okay, let me give me your tax returns, your W-2s, pay stubs. Oh, I don't make any, I don't show any money okay, there's a problem. What do you mean? I'll give you a bank account that says I could buy this house five times over in cash. Uh-uh. Ain't going to work today. What do you mean? I've got $5 million. Yeah, you're right. You're identifying with your money. Your money ain't going to get you that house. And now, if you want to pay cash for it, then it will. But my, my, what I'm saying that is when people say stuff like that, Oh, I've got, well, you're identifying with your money. Your money becomes who you are. But who's our ultimate source? God. End of sentence. He wants us to be financially prosperous. He just wants our heart right. Like when we were praying this morning, or this afternoon, or tonight, whatever we are. What, what is it? What today is it? Tonight. About over our offering right? If our hearts are right and we're cheerfully giving to the Lord because we're honoring him and, you know, those, you know, those who honor him, he will honor. When our heart is right, we want to see the gospel advanced. You know, we're, we're sowing, we're tithing. Our finances, our godly financial setup is going on. What is, he can't help but bless you. You can't help but be a conduit for God. That's not the love of money. That's money that's going to come in because you're being obedient to do what God's called us to do. How do we stay away from the love of money? We need to be content and thankful where we're at. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 through 8 says, And it is indeed a source of immense profit for godliness accompanied with contentment. The contentment, which is a sense of inward sufficiency, is great and abundant gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and obviously we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we shall be content and satisfied. Now, people will distort that. The enemy will distort that and say, oh, see, God wants you just just to have enough. That's not true. Paul is ministering to Timothy about being okay with God where you're at. It's the same Paul that wrote, I know how to be abased, live abased, lacking, and I know how to abound. Paul knew just how to be content whatever was going on with his life. Now, if you're dealing with something financially, but you're believing God and you see in his word that financial prosperity belongs to you, but hey, things don't in the natural look so good, that doesn't mean you can't be happy and content where you're at. You know, I'm gonna tell a story um, to illustrate this point, and some of you, I don't know if anybody here has heard it. It's been a long time since I told it, but years ago, I went through something catastrophic during those times financially of 2007 and 2008. I had gotten divorced in 2006. Um, the best years in my industry at that time were 2003, 2004, and 2005. So 
leading up to my divorce, which dragged on for three years. And I was saddled with an enormous alimony and child support debt based on those three prior years. So I got divorced in 06. Well, what came along in 07? I took no income for two years to try to keep my business afloat, yet paying huge alimony and child support. So I tore through everything I had. I, I had some property that I owned and sold that to keep paying that stuff, petitioning the court with like, hey, look, what happened in 03 and 04 or 05 is the exact opposite today. I'm not even taking an income, just trying to keep things rolling. Sorry, Mr. Minetti, we cannot tell you whether or not this is going to continue. So I had 11 motions for a reduction denied. All the while trying to keep a business going, which led me up one of the reasons. There was numerous reasons, and someday I'll give my testimony. Uh, why I walked away from a business with my two partners that we had for 11 years that we opened in 97 and I walked out of in 2008. I, walk, I left that business with $38 in my pocket, rent due, credit card bills due, car payments due. Um, so this was in 2008. Me and Jody had started dating in 2007 in the middle of all this financial stuff that was going on. And um, I just looked around and said, $38 in my name. <laughs> like, what am I going to do? And over a period of time, you know, the business didn't turn around in ev right away. And at that point in time, so this is 2008, I may have just started getting a, a hold on sowing and reaping. Barely, probably. Maybe not even yet. I don't remember the exact timing. Jody was a tither. Jody was always, we got a tithe, we got a tithe. I'm like, I got 38 bucks, you know. In the natural, I'm going, I don't even want to give you $3.80. It's just, it's not good, right? So we had went through a period of time. I love this story. I love this story. I didn't feel like I loved it at the time. But looking through, and, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you the years because this went on for a while. Um, I walked into the company now that I, I went to work for my now partner because I had brought him into the business years before, and he worked for me. And we always got along. I said, dude, I, I need a place to hang my hat and write business. And his uncle owned the company we worked for a time who I had known and had some business dealings with before. And he's like, yeah, give him, a, give him the deal you have. So, the thing, it, so I was blessed instantaneously in that I had a place to work. I had a very um, attractive financial offer, but nothing was going on. I was in arrears in my child support because now everything was, there was no money coming in at all. Um, so... We, we wound up in a period of time where, you know, our electric was shut off, heat was, you know, heat, everything was off, water was shut off, cable bills, all, everything. We went through these ups and downs and valleys. And my wife handled it pretty well. Now, we flash forward to this continued to go on for three or four years. We weren't married yet. We weren't obviously living together. She was living in Tom's River. I was living at my place up north. And so this stuff's all going on. We get married. Somehow in the middle of this, we, God's dealing with us, you know. And I, I'm going to tell you what God told her. Because when she was looking at it in the natural, like, and she'll, she'll just, she, I think she talks about this in her book. I know she does. She's looking at mine and her relationship. And we're doing our best, really trying to go deeper into things of God with $38 in my pocket, right? And she was seeking the Lord about, how am, I, how am I going to stay with him? You know, there's things I want for my life. You said you'd give me the desires of my heart. I don't see him here with this guy. Other than he works hard, but he's under a situation that he can't get out of that, you know, when I talk about the numbers, Pastor and Carol, Pastor, I already know these numbers. It was just like, how? Long and the short of it, she's praying to God, and God told her that if you, if you had more than enough, would it matter? And she's like, no. I'm talking financially. And he went, well, that's what I'm going to give you, meaning us together. So she stuck it out. We got married. Things continued, like, down this road. And it all culminated with something that happened in December of, I want to say, 2009-ish, somewhere in there, I think. No, we were married. Had to be 2011. Yeah, 2011 or 12. 
So literally now I had nothing. I'm, I'm, every nickel's coming in, I'm paying out to support to keep out of going to jail because they'll lock you up. And I've, I've been in jail for, uh, four or five, six times because I'm behind on my alimony. You know, child support I was always caught up with, but the way it broke down, the alimony technically was not so, you know, not a good place you're dealing with, right? So two things happened. The last time I got, I was picking my kids up from, uh, I don't know, somebody needs to hear this. That's why it's coming out. I had no intention of telling the story about finances tonight, but somebody needs to hear this. I was picking my children up from softball practice. And it was my night with them during the week. And I was coming home. I was in a rush because I had ordered Chinese food. Jody was, gonna come up, was coming up to have dinner with me and the kids. I pull into my townhouse complex. I get pulled over. There's a warrant for my arrest. I get arrested in front of my kids. Right? So anybody says you had a good, you never went through any of this, trust me, I went through it. Wind up in county jail. The sheriff's officer that comes to pick me up. Now, I, the town I lived in for 20 years was next to the town I grew up in. And all the, the chief of police is somebody I went to school with. So I know all the cops in town. So they're like, we're not going to handcuff you. We're not, we're just make it look like it's a disagreement or something. I said, well, don't you have to take my cell phone and keep it. So I'm in, the, I'm in the police station making phone calls, calling Jody, told her what happened. Sheriff's officers from Monmouth County come in. Guess who it is? A guy I went to school with. He's like, dude, what is going on? So it's an alimony thing. He goes, I knew it had to be something like that. It couldn't have been anything else. It's you. So they take care of me. I wind up in Ocean, or Monmouth County Jail. Sure enough, they're like, as I'm sitting in the pen going through all this, like I had to see the doctor, you know, all this stuff. I made a joke to the doctor. I said, my insurance going to cover this? He said, what are you talking about? You have medical insurance? What are you doing here? <laughs> Long story. So they put us up into the cells pods for the night because tomorrow is going to be like video court. And um, guy that walks in is a guy that my friend from high school arrested another friend of ours from high school that wound up being my roommate. Now, I see God in all this, and I'm literally locked up in the holding area in Monmouth County Jail praying in the Spirit. Nobody came near me, right? And they're like, There's no. nobody came near me. It was actually funny. I'm not going to, for a sake of time, go to video court the next day. I told, I'm like, Joe, call, call my, my, um, Call my attorney. I, there's nothing he could do, but is there anything I need to know? So they have a 37 people go into video court the next morning, if not more. And they're like, Minetti, you're up second. My attorney's here because people with attorneys go first. He wasn't. I have no idea to this day why I went second. So in front of everybody, they're like, yeah, 500 bucks, you're out. So I get out. Now, obviously, I didn't sleep the night before because of what was going on. So get, it's not like you're out. It's you'll be out in eight hours from now. We have to go through all the paperwork. So I fell asleep. But before I fell asleep, I was praying. I'm like, Lord, what the heck am I doing here? Like, what's God? I, I honestly, Lord, I don't understand. Just keeping it real with God. You know what he said to me? He said, well, you needed to experience what those you're going to minister to experience. And I was like, couldn't we have done it a different way? Couldn't I just had like a prison ministry? You know, I was like, no. So that was part one. Part two became, that was not the bottom. The bottom came a couple of years later when things were still going on. Business wasn't what it was, is now. Me and Jody found out, found, literally found ourselves with nothing again. And we had, all we had was a coin collection of quarters to get gas so I could drive to sell a guitar I had, the only guitar I had at that time, in order so we could buy some food. All the while coming here, nobody knew what we were going through. Because what did we do? We stood on the promises of God. And thinking at the time how difficult those financial situations were, when our, the, at the end, when our electric got shut off, I think I needed $500 or 400 whatever it was, to turn it back on. 
And me and Jody always keep a dedicated God account. So we had giving money. We had purpose to take out of every one of our paychecks that were coming in, despite of what we were dealing with. And, some tithe, and the tithe for the upcoming Sunday service from our checks and had it in a separate account. That account would have been enough to get our electric turned back on. And we're like, that was consecrated to the Lord. We will not touch it. So it was tough, right? It was tough. But we stood on the promises of God and flash forward, you know, learning, going deeper with sowing, reaping, the promises of God in every area of our lives, right? Really digging in, identifying with Christ and only Christ, walking by faith, not by sight. I look at those days where I thought I would have looked back and been like, what a disaster. I look back and say, what a blessing. What a blessing to have a privilege to go through that the way God wants and come out the other side. You know, I was, I was talking to my daughter, who's, you guys have met, she was here a couple weeks ago. She's, you know, she's saved, she's born again. She's actually writing a book about helping the military through Christian faith and everything. And um, we were, I was laughing. I was talking about that one guitar I sold. The only guitar, I wasn't even really playing the guitar then, but I had a guitar, always wanted to get back to it. And I sold it for um, food. And flash forward now, I literally, God put on my heart, and this isn't, I'm not telling you this, guy. I'm just saying how God works. I had the odd honor and privilege in these last year to give two guitars away to people, to sew, sew it to them, like here, this, you know, this is for you. And I still got four guitars, you know? So my point being is God is a God of restoration, but we can't be coming from a perspective of, because at that point, money certainly didn't have me because I didn't have any have me right? But I didn't seek after finances just to go after them. Like, oh, I can work nine jobs and this things will turn around. Well, God never told me to work nine jobs. He told me to stay the course what I'm doing. I was literally preaching at the time prosperity with that going on in my life, right? And, but the bottom line is we were sold out that God was going to come through. And I knew the work he, and I have no idea why we're here, but the Holy Spirit wants to, somebody to hear this. As we were going through this, the lessons we learned, the strength we got from standing, the identity we found more and more in Christ gave, gave the two of us the strength, I believe, to get through anything, any circumstances. And like I said, it wasn't pretty. And there was some ugliness in the middle of getting through this. But once we have that revelation that if God brought you somewhere, he's going to get you through it, right? And, you know, the enemy might have brought it for your harm, but God is going to use it for his good or our, our good in his glory. And that's the truth. And, you know, again, we wind up on finances tonight, but our trust can't be in finances. We need to be content where we're at. Our trust is in God who will then find us trustworthy to now provide financial blessings in our lives. I think we were kidding about this, I don't know if it was last week or in faith and healing school, but you know, we always say, hey, if I hit the lottery tomorrow, hmm, what are you going to do if you hit the lottery tomorrow? I'll pay off the church. Well, that's good. That's a good start. Then what, right? It's like, again, do you have your things and your money, or do your things and your money have you? So I guess we're going to pick this up next week because we didn't get to where we were going to go. So some, like I said, somebody needed to hear that. And again, I say that not to say, look at what we've done. Just an encouragement, man. I've been there. I've been there when it's come to stuff like that. And I know what it's like to feel like it's over and life is out of control. But the reality is when we surrender to God in everything, you know, one of the things I, sh I didn't tell you guys, I remember it would, the heat was off, the electric was off. The only thing that was on, the gas was still on. So we had a gas fireplace for heat. It was the winter. And so the, the, the uh, electric had just gotten turned off, so there was still stuff in the freezer. And I found, or we found, a package of a year old or a year and a half old meatloaf mix. We had that, we had some olive oil, and we had some, bre um, some breadcrumbs. That was the best, like, meatloaf I ever had when I think about it. And dollar store spinach. Who knew dollar store spinach would taste good? It was really good.
Actually, Jody is going to write a book, a little booklet called Dollar Store Spinach. So look for it coming soon. Glory to God. God is good, right? He's no respecter of persons, right? What he does for each and every one of us, he'll do for the other. Glory to God. So, Father, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your loving kindness, Father. We thank you as we go deeper in the things of you, as we continue to look at where our identity lies, that you are going to reveal things to us. More and more light, more and more revelation, knowledge to your word and your ways, Father. And we thank you for it. And next week, as we pick this up again, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. See everybody tomorrow for Faith and Healing School at 10.30, uh, Friday as well, and then Sunday service, 10 a.m.